McAllister, welcome to our special look back at this year's WHAS 11 vault. We begin inside the vault. This is where we store our expansive video archives spanning more than 70 years. And this is where we find all of that incredible footage we show you every Sunday night. Tonight, the first story we're looking back at is one with a very specific question. Where were you when the sewers blew? Hi, I'm Kirsty Wild. And I'm Jim Mitchell. The top news tonight is in Old Louisville, site of this morning's explosions. We are expanding tonight's news to one hour because of the story. Jim Mitchell is on the scene. Jim? Kirsty, what happened out here today is both a disaster and a miracle. WHAS 11 anchor Jim Mitchell was on the scene, describing damage spanning miles, collapsed streets, homes, and businesses destroyed. We um, were asleep and we heard this explosion, and then we got up and went outside and looked, and the whole street had just caved in. It was it was horrible. Manhole covers blown into the sky and then busting through roofs. We've got two holes down here to monitor simultaneously. The first sign of anything wrong came early on the morning of February 13th, 1981. My name is Steve Duncan. I'm the assignment manager at WHAS 11 News, uh, and I've been here for 40 years. Our in-house expert remembers it just like it was yesterday. He was only one month into the job at WHAS. If it had happened three hours later or six hours later, I can't imagine how many people might have been killed or certainly injured. There was nobody killed. It's hard to believe. Duncan moved with a live crew from scene to scene, showing the damage. The mayor said, and I quote, thank God only four people were hurt. Until the end of the day, when officials announced they had found a cause. City officials say they believe it was hexane that caused the explosion. And we know that between 1130 Thursday night and 515 Friday morning, there was no warning of what could and did happen. Ultimately, investigators laid the blame on Ralston Purina, a local soybean processing plant accused of spilling 18,000 gallons of hexane into the Louisville sewer system, leading to a series of explosions along 13 miles of sewer lines throughout the city. They weren't just small, uh, a small amount of damage. I mean, it was entire sections of road just blown up. Looked like something out of a war zone. As repairs got underway, our reporters tracked the progress. MSD workers here are making checks every 10 minutes or so at this point, this manhole here. This is where the sewer line has been blocked off from leading into the Ralston plant. And we understand, uh, well, we can probably get a check right now. What, what kind of reading are you getting? Getting a zero reading, which is a safe reading. And the community latched on to a certain saying. Where were you when the sword blew? There were people that had already made up t-shirts that said, where were you when the sewers blew? And they became collector's items and little souvenirs. The t-shirt merchants are already on the streets. And the t-shirt that was offered for sale here, where were you? when the sewers blew. It would take more than a year to fix the sewer lines, even longer to repair the streets. Four years after the explosions, the city of Louisville passed an ordinance giving MSD the authority to regulate the handling of hazardous materials like hexane and hope something like this would never happen again. It was and still is 40 years later, uh, one of the biggest news events, uh, most catastrophic news events in my time at the station, and I, I can imagine what it would be like if it happened now. Ten years before that massive sewer explosion, WHAS 11 dropped a bombshell investigation. We exposed an illegal gambling and prostitution scandal that was involving city officials. It was brought to light by WHAS 11 crews that went undercover and eventually led to statewide change. The purpose of the special programs on Channel 11 tonight and tomorrow night is to focus public attention on crime in Louisville. Documentary-length programming was nearly unheard of on local TV news before WHAS released this two-hour special. The telephone rings every 15 minutes or so with results from tracks all over the nation. The piece focused on politicians and police receiving money from the handbook operators in exchange for not enforcing gambling or prostitution laws. You are watching the inside of a Louisville bookie joint, posing as a regular customer, 
WHAS reporter Clarence Jones carried a concealed movie camera into this bedding room to photograph its daily operation. During his visits between October and January, neither the bookies nor the betters discovered the camera. This film, and much of the film you will see tonight, is the result of eight months of intensive undercover investigation. We call it Louisville Open City. An experienced investigator teamed up with a WHAS reporter to do the digging. Very few were aware of the investigation until it hit the air. Gamblers, prostitutes, and policemen who know Louisville call it an open city. That means that gambling and prostitution are allowed to operate openly here with the knowledge of the police, the prosecutors, and the politicians. Louisville Open City exposed more than 350 bookie operations. Leroy Hollis' book has the atmosphere of a friendly neighborhood tavern. Many of the customers are working men in khakis and dungarees who bring a beer with them. Friday and Saturday afternoons are particularly busy. And the hidden cameras caught police turning a blind eye to prostitution. There is an off-the-record belief among many so-called community leaders here that prostitution is good for the city. If Louisville is to become a convention city, the argument goes, it must provide girls and games for the visiting conventioners. In the days after the two-part special aired, the station received hundreds of phone calls with additional tips. Letters arrived after that. State lawmakers and the Kentucky Attorney General asked to see the program's script to investigate the claims of corruption. Within weeks, the bookies and club owners shown on film breaking the law were arrested and charged, and local judges cracked down on enforcing penalties. Commonwealth's attorney Tom Wine was in high school when the expose hit the air, but he says he remembers it. I was a junior in high school and, and there was talk at high school, at Atherton High School, uh, about some of this stuff going on. He says compared to 1971, much has changed in the way of gambling in Kentucky. Well, back in the 70s, if you wanted to, to uh, have an operation, a booking operation, uh, you paid for protection. All that's changed now. Everything that was illegal uh, is now legal. Not completely. I mean, there's still some restrictions, but uh, uh, just about everything that you would have arrested somebody or charged somebody or tried somebody for back in the 70s uh, is everyday commonplace now. Another noteworthy difference over the decades, accountability. Wine says the work WHAS did on this series was part of a major shift in how journalists started checking those in power. Reporters were much more active uh, during that time period than they had been before when they were simply reporting the news. It was kind of handed. Um, but now all of a sudden they were actively involved in doing undercover operations. So it was a big change back in the 70s. We think this report is convincing evidence that the time has come to change that practice. The future of Louisville and the future of the democratic process are at stake. Half a century later, Wine says the reminder of what went wrong is worthy. If you don't look at those stories, you're not going to remember uh, how people took advantage of the situation, how people um, bribed uh, elected officials, uh, allegedly, bribed police officers, allegedly. Those type of uh, um, things cannot be forgotten. We have to remember uh, so that we don't repeat those mistakes. Next, we revisit the history of the Kentucky Center for African American Heritage. The building dates back to the late 1800s. In 1999, WHAS 11 was there when the building saw its first major renovation, the groundbreaking of the center. But it would take 10 years for the center to actually open to the public after endless delays and halted construction. Conventions and events eventually helped to fund the center, bringing in people and money. Now it's run by the Tourism Bureau for the state and considered an educational space as well. I think we can play a very important role in the area of education. I think one of the things that's lacking in our um, state is an understanding about African American culture and heritage. Today, the center is focused on developing apprenticeship programs, community development, and ramping up the genealogy program. And it was just that perfect moment in time uh, for Louisville to shine and come to the fore. 39 years ago, Louisville played a major role in the success of a Ford Ranger, rolling off the assembly line right into showrooms. That moment when we come back. 
The top brass at Ford Motor Company knew they couldn't take a chance. They had to produce a marketable auto filling today's needs in today's consumer price range. That idea would become the Ford Ranger, a historic moment in Kentucky's history. Louisville was the truck capital of the world. It was March of 1982, and all of this brought hope and happiness to thousands of workers. Ford workers from the top management to the factory workers are anxiously awaiting the official March 12th general sales start date, a date they hope will go down in the company history as the turnaround in the sagging American auto industry. It was months in the making, the debut of the 1982 Ford Ranger. And it was just that perfect moment in time uh, for Louisville to shine and come to the fore. The Archives and Heritage brand manager for Ford Motor Company says the launch of the small to mid-sized truck was strategic. Coming at a time when money was tight for most Americans and workers needed jobs. The decision was made to bring back the work to America and to launch an uh, all new small mid sized pickup truck called the Ranger. And the Louisville assembly plant was the plant that was chosen to launch this fantastic new vehicle. When production began earlier this year on Ford's newest light truck, the Ranger, it meant jobs for thousands of workers. Coming back was pretty good. Just everybody's taking an interest in it. You know, it's a new truck, and we're the only plant in the world doing it. So everybody's ordered up, so now it's up to the public out there to help keep me in a job. Produced exclusively at the Kentucky Truck Assembly Plant, the production of the Ford Ranger reopened the plant and almost instantly demand was high. Once the ribbon was snipped, 93 Ford dealers from Kentucky, Indiana, and Tennessee climbed into identical red and white Ranger pickup trucks to drive back to their dealerships. Sky 11 captured the moment nearly 100 Rangers in that iconic red and white body rolled off of the plant property, heading for dealerships across the region. Ford dealers have ordered 35,000 of the subcompact trucks already, more than Ford has been able to produce so far. The new truck stimulated Americans' desire for something different in the market. It also stimulated the Louisville economy, but the thrill didn't last. The Ranger, that small to mid-sized truck, had pretty much worked its magic and was tapering off, sales were tapering off uh, by the late 90s and we're looking for a replacement. But Louisville, which was the truck capital of the world for just a moment, never lost the love of that original Ranger. More Rangers were sold in the Louisville district than any district in the United States. Almost four decades later, history is now repeating itself with a newly released, revamped Ranger. One Ford official say the country was asking for. Obviously, Ranger has a tremendous heritage. Um, I think what's great about today's Ranger is that it really is just built on everything that's made Ranger great over the years, and including when we brought it to market back in 1982. In another twist of fate, the Ranger relaunch comes at the same time as Ford releases an all-new Bronco. Ford officials tell me this little truck isn't their only ace in the hole. Ford plans to start building its small four-wheel drive Bronco 2 truck at the Fern Valley Road plant in about eight months. And so they say, history repeats itself. Now to extreme weather in the area and a storm nobody could forget. It was 1997 and Kentucky was declared a disaster zone. The famous flood caused damage to 50,000 homes, even closures at Interstate 64 and 65 because the water was so high. The explorers at the Ford plant stood up to their door handles in flood water, ruined forever. And at captain's quarters, the captain was covered. The water will go down and towns and lives will be rebuilt. But the people and the places who lived through this week will always remember that rainy weekend and the flood of 97. The cleanup would take months and the flood would go into the record books as one of the worst in state history. WHAS 11 did its part to help the community, holding a telethon in an attempt to help families in need. It's the opening ceremony that kicks off the Derby Festival every year. When we come back, we count down the most memorable moments and see how it all started. Welcome back. Louisville has always been known for the Kentucky Derby, but in 1989, Kentucky Derby Festival staff wanted to create something new, something exciting, something with a bang. Enter Thunder Rover Louisville and the most memorable moments in the decades since. Ladies and gentlemen, let the festival begin. 
That signature sign-on from Mayor Jerry Abramson on April 17, 1990, ahead of the first-ever Thunder Over Louisville. This first-ever opening ceremony event just might take over as one of the most popular Derby Festival events. And Melissa was right. From the air show... That's it, one of the final Derby City Skydivers fireworks ringing out above the old Cardinal Stadium as country singer Janie Fricky performed a free concert for the crowd. Catch the road, festival show, Kentucky Derby Festival. The first ever Thunder Over Louisville was a massive success. So much so, the team behind it knew they needed a new space for the next year. In 1991, the show moved to the riverfront. Now, just picture in your mind that in a few moments, you're going to see fireworks literally exploding before your very eyes. The new location, a perfect match, as massive crowds gathered along the shore of the Ohio River, looking up as the official clock counted down. <laughs> From a crew of 65 in 1990 to nearly 900 one year later, the operation has always been led by one man, Thunder's mastermind, Wayne Hedinger. Just a few years ago, we got a tour of his personal Thunder archive, his basement. There's memories on all these. As soon as I start seeing these notes, uh, it's pretty, pretty well. Oh yeah, I remember that. Memorable moments from Louisville's largest show have not been few or far between. From a UFO sighting in 1992. <laughs> We're frightened! That's Wayne Hedinger, you must know okay. something. What's going on out there? If this, this was a surprise to us all. To a wedding four years later. I told you a little bit ago about the wedding that's to take place tonight on the 2nd Street Bridge. A makeshift chapel went up on the 2nd Street Bridge as a couple tied the knot. Another year, on that same bridge, something unexpected. Yeah, we, uh... We don't think this is supposed to be happening right here, but, uh... <coughs> Things haven't always gone as planned during Thunder's past. In 97, a frightening near-fatal accident. When a skydiver's feet got tangled in his parachute, his head falling toward the ground. Luckily, the skydiver managed to get his feet free, deploying the emergency chute, landing safely. The date, December the 7th, 1941. Controversy surrounded the 10th annual show when Tora 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 was booked to perform. The planes reenacted the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Some felt the performance would offend Japanese Americans, but the group stood by. They were honoring all involved. Three, two, one, zero. 2000 brought us a millennium thunder. More fireworks went off in the first 60 seconds than in the first five minutes of the 1999 show. But the show wasn't the only thrill delivered that day. Meet Thundasia. Her mother was walking to the waterfront to watch the show and went into labor, delivering Thundasia on a sidewalk at 8th and Market. When you do something for this long, the years sometimes run together, but one always stands out when you ask Wayne Hedinger. Boy, when 9-11 happened, that changed everything. I mean, across the boards uh, with our aircraft, with the, with the river craft. The show became more complicated to plan and execute, but it never lost its luster. You shake my nerves and you rattle my brain. Too much of love drives a man insane. The air show has only grown since first starting in 1992. Hedinger has called it history on display, an idea for some daytime entertainment. Over the last decade, the show has only gotten bigger and better every year. But if there's one thing that always stays the same, it might be the one thing out of everyone's control. Mother Nature will let you know who's boss, that's for sure. But who's complaining when Mother Nature steals the show with a sunset like this one from 2017 ahead of another unforgettable Thunder Over Louisville? The project first broke ground in 1984 and then fully opened its doors in 1985. It was a sight to see after 16 years of planning. Dressed to the nines, famous faces alongside Louisville locals shuffled into the new museum. This is something that all Kentuckians can be proud of. That is so glorious and I can't believe that uh, all of this could have been done in such a short time. From the moment it opened to the public, its mission of telling stories of past derbies to future generations has stayed the same. They're creepy, they're crawly, and you'll almost certainly recognize their sound. 
The vault takes us back to the history of cicadas in Kentucky, next. After spending the last 17 years underground, the cicadas have returned. They'll climb up anything vertical, the sides of houses, trunks of trees, even telephone posts. Do you remember that sound from last summer? It wasn't the first time Louvillians have heard cicadas, and it probably won't be the last. The WHAS 11 Vault has video going back to 1970, when our team caught a cicada debut. They would return in 1987, and then again in 2004 and 2008. That year, they alarmed some Anchorage neighbors so much, they called for help. I called the police and asked them, and they assured me that the noise is from the cicadas. I tried counting them on this tree once, and I lost track after about 300. What seemed to surprise viewers the most was people who dared to take a walk on the wild side, saying bottoms up to the culinary side of cicadas. Gas prices have been up and down in the wake of the pandemic, but that's nothing new for Louvillians. Next, we take you back to the 1970s, when all eyes were on problems at the pump. It was the end of the decade, and rising fuel prices were starting to put pressure on people's pocketbooks, especially independent truckers. After they said they would strike, people started to panic and went straight to the pump. Some waited hours and never even got gas. Once the truckers went on strike, it made matters worse, causing protests and prompting the governor to step in and protect the drivers who tried to keep the gas flowing. Governor Julian Carroll called in the state police to assist and later the National Guard until eventually everything calmed down. Louisville has a long history with bourbon and horse racing, but it also has a history with passenger trains like Amtrak. Going back to the 1970s, the Floridian started in Chicago. It went through Louisville and ended in the Sunshine State, but it didn't last. And the train just kept chugging with Louisville in the rear view. She starts in Chicago and rumbles through the night to Louisville. Her name was the Southwind until Amtrak took her over in 1971. Then she was renamed the Floridian. The Floridian became notorious for lackluster on-time performance, poor track conditions, and low ridership. And in September of 1979, passengers and staff said their final farewell. I've been here in my practically 30 years. I've seen air passenger trains leave one by one. It would be a 20-year absence until Amtrak was back in Kentuckyana. Departing Jeffersonville at night and rolling for 12 hours, reaching Chicago the next morning. The first train rolled in 1999. If I had to choose something other than a car, plane, bus, or a train, I'd take the train. And it wasn't long until Amtrak set its sights on Louisville. The bridge is already in place to carry trains over the river. But Louisville needs to find land to build a train station. You see, the old one, this one here, now belongs to executives who work for TARC. One year after debuting the Jeffersonville destination, Doug Prophet covered the consideration to bring it one step further to that very spot, the old Union Station in downtown. 50 passenger trains used to arrive and depart daily from Louisville's Union Station in its heyday. At the time, it was an office preserved like a museum with original stained glass, tile flooring, wooden benches, and even over one of the doors, a sign to the trains. The freight trains that have ruled the river tracks alone for more than 30 years will now have company as Louisville looks to reconnect with its locomotive routes. The plan gained steam with support from politicians, and in 2001, the Kentucky Cardinal crossed the Ohio River for the very first time. After a golden spike ceremony with Mayor David Armstrong, it was all aboard in southern Indiana. Good morning. Here. Glad to see Amtrak back in town. The unofficial Amtrak beat reporter at the time, Doug Prophet, was there. The trains may run on time, but midway over the river, the Kentucky Cardinal had to stop so a barge could pass through. This is quite a view. The passenger train bends and weaves as it moves its way across the bridge. <gasps> what a I vista. Mean, it's incredible. As it leaves the bridge, train watchers greet the Cardinal when it hits Louisville for the first time. 
But about a month after the celebration started, talk that the city's $300,000 investment could be worthless. There's a possibility that uh, that it could be dis service could be discontinued on this line. Amtrak was losing money nationwide, asking Congress for a bailout, but targeting 18 long distance routes for cancellation, including the newly christened Kentucky Cardinal line from Chicago to Louisville. The trains that carry cargo are busy in the city. The tracks that carry the Kentucky Cardinal Amtrak passenger train at Union Station are empty by early morning as the train leaves for Chicago at 7.30 a.m. Just a short time later, the last passenger train passed over the tracks in July 2003. And since then, it's been only freight locomotives ruling the Louisville tracks like they had for so many decades before. He was the go-to guy for any and all gardening-related questions in Kentuckiana for more than 30 years. We take a look back at Fred Wishy's far-reaching legacy next. For more than 30 years, The Weekend Gardener aired every Friday night right here on WHAS 11. It was enormously popular and hosted by Fred Wishy, one of our first ever reporters. Right now, we take a look back at his storied legacy in radio and TV, first on the air in the 1950s. I'm Fred Wishy, The Weekend Gardener. Most remember Fred Wishy for that signature sign off paired with gardening advice that was understandable for everyone. If you've got limited space in your garden, but you'd like to grow a lot more things, think vertical. He worked for just one set of call letters, but had many careers. Early on, Fred was found behind the anchor desk. Fred Wishy anchors our 615 report, a complete and comprehensive film report on today's happenings in Kentuckiana. He was one of the founding reporters in the television industry. After 20 years of wearing the coat and tie in the form of an anchor and then political reporter, Fred blended gracefully into the clothes of a working gardener. As far as sowing grass seed, don't do that now. You're just wasting money. Wait until the ground temperature warms up sometime in about early April. That's the time to do it. He covered what he enjoyed and always included a laugh. So if you don't want to have to cut a hole in the ceiling in order to keep your house plants indoors, stop feeding them. Put them on a liquid diet of just good plain rainwater. It's not often that the weekend gardener gets treated to some homemade goodies while visiting a local gardener, but... He even indulged a bit from time to time. In this case, and this lemon cream pie is just out of this world. As the years passed, the community was relentless with their questions, and Fred always found an answer. Somebody called the other day and said, what's the record in weight for a zucchini? You don't want to know what the record weight is for a zucchini because you never want your zucchini to get that big. He chalked up his decision to start and end his career in Louisville to some advice from a professor at Northwestern where he got his master's. If you want the best, you go to Louisville. That is the best news operation in the country. It was then and it still is. That was in 1997 when he was inducted into the Kentucky Journalism Hall of Fame. The recognition came after 40 years in front of the camera. But Fred would go on to transcend the limits of broadcast, eventually putting pen to paper. The Fred Wishy Almanac sold thousands of copies, and a newspaper column was carried by two dozen weekly newspapers. You know my rule of gardening. You never tell a gardener something can't be done. Fred worked morning, noon, and night. He woke up to radio, dashed to personal appearances, and spent his evenings on TV. His Lawn and Garden Expo became one of the largest consumer shows in the region, and he presented one lucky gardener at the Kentucky State Fair each year with the prestigious Wishy Award. It really was outstanding, very colorful, and uh, we want to uh, present you with the tray that Jenny and I uh, give every year for the best specimen during the Kentucky State Fair. Congratulations. Because of his depth of knowledge and ability to recall facts at a moment's notice, Fred Wishy became a beloved community resource. Is there such a thing as a perennial mom, one that will definitely come back year after year? Well, my answer to that is yes, there are some. This happens to be one. There is no telling how many questions he answered during his storied career, making his mark on journalism and leaving his legacy 
and the towering trees and blooming gardens across Kentucky. He said it best himself. His wish was a simple one. That in one very small way, I may have helped make this a better world in which to live, not only for today, but for tomorrow, for generations yet unborn. And forevermore, he will be known as the People's Gardener. For Kentucky Anna's News Channel, WHS 11, I'm Fred Wishy, the Weekend Gardener. In 1996, Wishy was diagnosed with cancer. He continued to do his reports while undergoing treatment. But two years after his diagnosis, he died in his Shelby County home. He was 66. Marble Hill, does that name ring a bell? It was supposed to bring power to the region, but was plagued by delays, making it one of the most expensive projects never finished. Construction started on the Marble Hill nuclear plant near Madison, Indiana in 1978, but people protested and workers reported faulty repair jobs and dangerous concrete work. So the completion date just kept getting set back. Eventually, inspectors gave the go ahead, but more protests and delays caused the project to be halted yet again. By 1984, a task force investigating the plant came to the conclusion the costs were just too high to finish and it was no longer needed. It is its recommendation that the Marble Hill Nuclear Power Facility, presently being constructed by Public Service Company of Indiana, not be completed. The scrapped project caused thousands to lose their job. The New York Times reported in 1984 the total cost of the project was around $2.5 billion. To be a part of this celebration is, is unbelievable. The Summer Olympics returned this year. Next, we look back at the 1996 Games when the torch made its way through Kentuckiana. All eyes were on the Summer Olympics in Tokyo this year, but we were focused on one special event from decades earlier. In 1996, Louisville had its own special moment with the Olympic torch. On its way to Atlanta, the Olympic torch relay was in full swing, moving from coast to coast and passing through Kentuckiana on its way. We first found the flame about 70 miles north of Louisville. The crowds cheer as the Olympic flame comes through Columbus, Indiana. The cameras come out and the flames ignite the Olympic spirit. WHAS 11 crews were on the ground and in the air, taking in the historic torches trail. A large crowd gathered downtown for a celebration. All along the route, spectators waved American flags and cheered wildly. From there, the torch traveled south to Sellersburg, where longtime WHAS 11 anchor Gary Rodemeyer had his chance to make his mark on history. Here comes Gary right now, Gary Rodemeyer! <laughs> Gary wasn't the only familiar face to touch the famous torch. Next up, WHAS 11 reporter and Louisville Tonight Live host, Kirby Adams. <laughs> Kirby's stretch was on Charlestown Road in New Albany. My run was short and sweet, and while I would have liked to have had a little longer with the actual flame, at least I have the torch to remember it by. And this torch is extra special because it was designed by a Kentucky native. That Kentucky native, Malcolm Green, who was born in Mill Springs, Kentucky, and grew up in Somerset. He was a former lecturer at U of L, and only part of the torch's ties to our city. The wood handle on the torch also has a Kentucky connection. It was made by the Louisville Slugger people, Hilrick and Bradsby. When the flame arrived in downtown Louisville, it was met with a celebration on the Belvedere. Alice Lucille Martin, Olympic torchbearer. Alice Martin, a YMCA volunteer, had the honor of starting the Olympic flame on its journey through Louisville. A succession of runners made their way to Churchill Downs, where hundreds showed up to watch Derby winner Pat Day take his turn. Hey, I'm doing great. Thank you. Day carried the storied flame down the stretch to the oh so familiar finish line. To be a part of this celebration is. It's unbelievable. Meanwhile, on Eastern Parkway, an excited Melinda Miller was waiting on her turn. Everybody's going crazy. <laughs> There's my brother. Minutes later, it was Miller's time. Here we go. We are ready. Oh, Thousands of spectators lined the route for a chance to watch history make its way through our city. Some folks at Parkway Medical Center even brought their own torch. And then perhaps the most miraculous leg of the relay, when Bill Taffel took to the road, carrying the flame 
overcoming a life-threatening illness and surgery just months earlier. So how was it? Oh, it was very great. It was great. A little bit tough on the hips, but, you know, it's worth it. Worth it. That was the common sentiment for all who touched the famous torch. I've done lots of nice things and given recognition, but this is the piece of resistance. The torch eventually left Louisville, heading to Cincinnati and then Detroit. It went all over the Northeast before finally going down to Florida and then ending up in Atlanta, ready for the 1996 Olympic Games. <laughs> Now to a game unique to Louisville. The Dainty Fest was first introduced by German immigrants in the 1800s, but it was nearly forgotten until it was revived in 1971 thanks to George Hauck, a World War II veteran whose parents started Hauck's Handy Store on Goss Avenue in Schnitzelburg. Throughout the years, it became a staple in the Germantown neighborhood, and WHAS 11 personalities got in on that fun. And then if you lost, then you had to, the one that lost the thing had to uh, hop as far as distance as the rest of them, hit it. The winner said, well, where you been? I said, playing Danny. The heart of the dainty contest has always been George Hauk. He said the competition kept players young at heart, and for him, it couldn't be more true. The dainty contest founder competed until he was 92 years old and passed away last year at the age of 100. This year marked 44 years since the king of rock and roll was laid to rest. All eyes were on the funeral services for Elvis Presley. 30,000 fans attended, including former WHAS 11 anchor Jim Mitchell. For the man they called the king, this is the rock and roll world state funeral. They began lining up here late last night. They sat through sweltering 90 degree temperatures waiting to pay their final respects to Elvis Presley. August 1977, WHAS 11 anchor Jim Mitchell stood among the tens of thousands of fans flocking to Memphis, Tennessee, hoping for a chance to get inside Graceland. <laughs> Elvis fans were heartbroken at the news of his passing. Some in the crowd even fainted, Mitchell reported. He was my hero. He was the only thing in this whole wide world that mattered to me. I love him so much. He's a fabulous person. I don't know what I feel. It's just, I feel empty. Back home in Louisville, WHAS 11 reporters found their way to local record stores. Well, what you're hearing is the song of a man who became a legend in his own time. The song that you're hearing is probably one of the last singles he ever cut, and it's on this album, which is probably one of the last albums he ever cut. One of the many albums that will probably become collector's items. Fans buying up his records, mourning his death. I don't know, it's just sad that we lost. 380 miles away, Jim Mitchell reported live from the funeral. Elvis was not just the singer, he was the song. For these people, the anthem of a generation that grew up in the 50s and 60s. The doors to Graceland were closed to the public, but many celebrities drove in to attend. And crowds grew big outside the gates, some driving hundreds of miles to be there, including Kentuckians. Mitchell found them and asked them why they made the trip. Because I loved him so much. I just can't believe it. I won't come here and see for myself. You won't be able to see too much today. They'll just be driving no, by. No, just see his hearse. It's good enough. During his lifetime, Elvis was no stranger to Louisville. He performed at the Armory, now known as the Louisville Gardens. This video from our archive showing the music venue in 1956 as excited fans packed the house ahead of the Elvis arrival. About two decades later, he was back, this time at Freedom Hall. Our WHAS 11 cameras caught the King leaving the 1974 performance, waving goodbye to his many fans. It was Elvis's long and storied career that led to his popularity and massive turnout on the day of his funeral. After an hour inside, the funeral party drove down Elvis Presley Boulevard, and a young woman broke from the crowd and tried, it seemed, to throw herself in front of the hearse. Police caught her before any harm could be done, and the procession moved along toward Forest Hill Park. Elvis was buried in a mausoleum a few hundred yards from where his mother was buried, covered in hundreds of flowers and worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. It was called a display worthy of the king of rock and roll. Many people will be saying and writing after this moment that we've come to the end of an era. 
But maybe not. Elvis once made an album called 50 Million Elvis Fans Can't Be Wrong. And over the years, their numbers grew, and so did their affection. It may be that although the life of Elvis has ended, the legend has not. This is Jim Mitchell, News 11, in Memphis. They're one of the most iconic bands of all times. The Rolling Stones have sold out stadiums all across the world, and they're no stranger to Louisville. First performing in Kentuckiana in 1964 and making several trips back since then. It was August 4th, 1975. A private plane landed at Louisville's Stanford Field and Mick Jagger himself made an appearance. For only the second time ever, the Rolling Stones were on Louisville soil, and demand for tickets was skyrocketing. Are you making any money? Uh, some of the people are. What are they going for? Depends on what, where they're located, you know, and um, how bad they want to get rid of them, too. You know, like right now, you can probably get one pretty cheap because it's getting kind of wet out here. The Stones wouldn't return to Louisville again until 1981. Here's one election you probably haven't heard about. Ballots or tickets were cast here at Freedom Hall for the world's greatest rock and roll band. And the winner, uncontested, the Rolling Stones. This time, WHAS 11 cameras were inside for the show. Fans were ecstatic to see some of the greatest of all time right in their own backyard. The best. <laughs> They've been at it long. And they're here tonight! The legends in their own time. With the U.S. tour of 1981 a massive success, the Stones returned in 1989 for the Steel Wheels tour at the old Cardinal Stadium. Mick Jagger addressing the crowd of eager fans. Hey Louisville, how you feeling? It's a beautiful night. As the stadium started to fill up, our WHAS 11 team spotted a crew making the trip a family affair. Outside, before the show, one veteran Stones fan wheeled into Louisville driving a Winnebago full of her children. It was their first live look at the band. I brought my children and it's the first time they've been to a concert. But that was only part of this special story. For this mother, the Rolling Stones concert was fulfilling a family tradition. And my mother brought me in 1964 and I brought my kids, four of them. For the fans, a crowd estimated at over 40,000 in Cardinal Stadium, the lure of the Stones comes in the music and the personalities. It would be 17 years before the Rolling Stones returned, but their 2006 appearance might be the most memorable of them all, with the Stones arriving at the Seelbach Hotel in downtown Louisville, and then lighting up the track at Churchill Downs. Sky 11 was there, catching a view of the crowd and the band from above. Hey, how you doing down there? Fantastic. It's really nice to be here. I tell you, we, we, haven't, been in, we haven't been in Louisville since 1989. That's a very long time ago. It's great to be back. Tens of thousands watched the longest performing rock band of all time and then waved goodbye as the musicians took off for a motorcade through the streets of Louisville. It would be the last time we saw the iconic group in Louisville until a scheduled 2020 tour date that was interrupted by the COVID pandemic. Before we leave you tonight, we have to extend a very special thank you to our editor here at WHAS 11, Troy Whitaker. He has worked hard week after week to bring you these incredible stories from here in the WHAS 11 vault. This would not be possible without him. We also thank you for joining us on this special look back at the best of the WHAS 11 vault in 2021.